This next bit, we get to move into a panel discussion. I'd like to introduce uh, Narjis Bani Asadi, who is the founder of Bina Technologies, one of the groups that's really bringing engineering to bear on this problem. And I'd uh, like to ask her to introduce the panelists. Thank you, Matt. Hello, everyone. Good, mo good morning. Uh, so I'm Nargis Banias, I CEO and founder of Bina Technologies, now part of Roche Sequencing. Today we have a very interesting panel about next generation sequencing data and the opportunities and challenges that it is bringing forward for bioinformaticians, scientists and, and clinicians in the industry. So before we start the panel, just a few words about Bina and Roche Sequencing. Uh, we are uh, part of a larger family <coughs> in Roche Sequencing since last year. The vision at Roche Sequencing is to create a very comprehensive end-to-end -end sample to answer workflow for uh, genomics. And um, uh, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, we have made a tremendous progress around different technologies for sample preparation, capture, uh, DNA isolation, all the way to analysis and informatics. And the role that Bina plays in, in Roche family is to build the informatics platform, analysis solutions, and interpretation of genomics information. Uh, so today, we are going to discuss together what are the challenges in front of us? What are the unique uh, you know, problems or opportunities next generation sequencing is creating for the industry, whether it is in research or clinical diagnostic? But we want to also hear what you think about it. We have thought about it a lot in the last few years, and we had several good conversations with our panelists that you will hear today, but we also want to see how you think about it. So we have put together a poll. If you go to bina.com slash poll, uh, you will see it's very simple, just 10 questions. Uh, these are the 10 top challenges that we have been hearing in the field from many different types of users, and we want to see how you think about them. Do you think they are real? Which one is more important? So um, I want to um, take a moment and introduce our panelists, which I think are bringing very interesting insight to this discussion. Um, we have Dr. Rong um, Chen. Uh, Rong is representing clinical research and academic research uh, of interpretation of next generation sequencing. He is an assistant professor and director of clinical genomic informatics in Econ School of Medicine in Mount Sinai now. His research is focused on using big data approach uh, to interpret human genome for different clinical applications. Uh, Rong is well known to many of us. He has published many papers, over than, over than 70, I believe, in uh, translational bioinformatics in very well-known journals. Uh, he also is very active on the commercial scene. He actually was one of the early advisors of Bina, and he has also um, helped uh, launching two companies, Personalis and LifeMap Solution, and he's also advising food genomics. Uh, our other panelist, Dr. Matt Barr, he is representing the pharmaceutical and drug discovery applications, actually, of next generation sequencing. He's currently leading the genomics team at Genentech and uh, handling uh, all the high throughput data for research and development uh, sciences at Genentech. Uh, his education is in statistics and biology uh, and biochemistry at Berkeley and, and UT Austin. And he also spent some good amount of time at Stanford and Princeton doing his postdoctorate studies. So thanks so much for joining us uh, in this panel today. So uh, let's talk about the challenges. We spend a lot of time to think about how to organize it because there are just so many different challenges we hear about. And we came up with four buckets that we think might, uh, might simplify the problem a little bit. Uh, so today we are going to talk about each of them. The four buckets of challenges are scientific challenges around making sense out of the data and link it to you know, uh, biology or, or clinical outcomes. The people challenges, which is around you know, how we find good bioinformaticians, how we have bioinformaticians, clinicians, scientists work together in solving these complex problems. Process challenges, which is about how to govern the data, how to have flexible yet really auditable and secure, reliable processes around consuming this data in organizations, and technology challenges, of course, around how to manage this information, store them, and, and do the compute. <coughs> so let's, let's start um, to look at the scientific challenges. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask our panelists, maybe Ron can talk to us about 
what are the scientific challenges he's seeing in his uh, day job um, around you know, making sense out of genomic data? Sure, thanks for introductions. For the accuracy side, for cancer precision medicines, we very often found somatic variants have very, very low uh, allelic frequencies. So how we get really even lower than 1%, 0.1%, that's uh, one challenge. Not just from the technology side, but also from algorithm side. So currently, it's try, the variant quality is always in general, but we need to really tune this algorithm to detect this low abundance uh, variance because we often we see the resilience mutation is already there, but just in very subchrome, very low frequency. And we have been found in the published data that uh, the variant also there, but people didn't capture it because it's so low abundance. Uh, from the annotation side, uh, I think two key, one is uh, the population frequencies. So we, did, we recently curated 150,000 genome and from 50 different disease cohorts and so on, putting their divas, but I think we need to do more. We really need to get to like one million genomes, every single variance, we know what a frequency in hundreds of thousands of disease populations. Only by that we can really understand uh, which variants, how much contribute into the disease. And the second part is uh, function variant. We, it's urgent need, we need a database with all the variants that has a functional impact. So current algorithms only saying is a damaging or likely damaging, that's definitely not enough. We need to put all these uh, functional impact into a context. Is this variance the break expression of the gene? Like for example, is this, currently there's not even a, a good database to say all the activating mutations, right? The, we definitely need to put this functional impact into the context, gene level, protein level, uh, system levels, and so on. And from the interpretation side, uh, one is uh, for high C subject, we still cannot predict disease risk well. We need more uh, G by E analysis to really better risk more than all these disease. Maybe more, not in general, but let's say example are, among type 2 diabetes patient, can you predict who get Alzheimer's? So these kind of specific questions have a good risk modeling. Thank you. Uh, very good examples of scientific challenges ahead of us. Uh, the next set of challenges are around process challenges about how to build end-to-end -end analytics frameworks, how to govern the data and keep it secure and private and many more details. So I think Matt is uh, uh, spending a lot of his time solving these challenges at Genentech. Do you want to talk uh, to us about it a little bit? Yes, thanks, Narcus. Um, so just a little bit of background and context. Uh, my group is in the bioinformatics department, which is a research department at Genentech, and historically, We've been responsible largely for preclinical data, so this is our in vitro and in vivo studies um, for the genomics data. And we've supported a large group of, um, of computational biologists and bioinformatics scientists, and we've really been walking the line of, of trying to uh, maximize the opportunity for um, innovation versus uh, keeping, keeping a, a, a lid on it to some extent and ensuring reproducibility. Um, it's, it's actually fairly catastrophic for us if we get different um, scientists coming up with different answers uh, in, and it leads to some, some major investment decision. Um, so uh, from that context, um, we've recently started moving into a position where um, we're realizing that a, a huge amount of our assets uh, are related to the clinical trials data that we have. So uh, more than half of the drugs that we have in the clinic have a strong genetic component. Um, and we know that the gene association studies, if we, if we could look at those, uh, the, the genetics of those patients, would, would help us increase the probability of success for, for our drugs uh, and for biomarkers. And so um, one of our big challenges has been incorporating the, the clinical research and the, uh, the development sciences into our group. Um, and this has had a, uh, the, the main challenges, frankly, have been, have been about process and about scaling up. So we've gone from being kind of a, a boutique operation to where we have to be doing things wholesale and, and doing things reproducibly, but with maintaining the flexibility so that when a new method comes along, we can actually incorporate it meaningfully and that, and that everyone can have access to it. And there's a, um, a phrase that a colleague of mine uses, um, cattle not pets, where we, we have our data sets and until now we've sort of been treating them as, you know, as pets and giving them names and being very um, uh, solicitous of them. And at this point, we want to just herd them all into a pen and you know, get what we can out of them. And that's, that's a huge challenge um, from, from a, a bioinformatics science perspective. Um, 
you know, we're um, just just for some um, details, we have um, roughly 60,000 patient samples in our freezers from trials that have gone back uh, 10 to 15 years, um, and we're slowly marching through these and sequencing them, um, whole genome sequencing, and um, just scaling that up is is a vast challenge. Um, not only the compute resources, um, which I think we're meeting pretty well, but you know, where do you put the data? How do you make it accessible? Once, once you've done the, the primary analysis that you have planned, what then? You know, we, it's the, the data are expensive enough that we don't want to just you know, stash them somewhere. Um, so that's, that's something that, um, and we've been working with, with uh, Bina to, to address some of these issues. Um, sort of along a, a parallel track, you know, we have clinical trial data, so we have all the data that went into the filing for our various drugs and demographic data and, and detailed medical records for these patients. Um, it's not that easy actually to get a hold of that. These, these are data that were collected for one purpose and we're, we're trying to repurpose them. And so the other big challenge is really um, figuring out how to integrate complex phenotype data with our, with our patient data so that we can actually do systematic computation on them. That's great. Thank you, Matt. So the next set of challenges around people <laughs> challenges. You know, what, what we are seeing is that there are some really big trends in the industry uh, to create a data-driven medicine, to make data really useful in uh, discovering new biomarkers or drug targets and, and solutions. And, you know, the, the research has been always ongoing. So what is new today? Uh, it seems that next generation sequencing uh, has new challenges. For example, the volume of the data, the complexity, uh, the scientific nature of it, that every day we see a new publication of how to make sense out of data around annotations or new bioinformatics tools. So it is an, a very dynamic field and uh, most of the organizations who are courageous enough to, to get into NGS domain, they need to build very strong teams that are capable of solving this problem, both from the infrastructure IT perspective all the way to the scientific and computational biology aspect of it. So my question to the panelists is that, how do they find these people? And then uh, also, you know, these are large scale projects. Usually you need many different expertise that many times is not in, in your team and are in other teams, either in your organization in different places or maybe, you know, across different organizations. How do they bring different people who might speak different languages even, you know, they, they, know, they know different domains and they reside in different places. So, Maybe we talk a little bit about people challenges. Matt, do you want to go first? Because we were just talking about it before the panel. Sure, sure. So, you know, we're, we're really um, both blessed and cursed about, by, by our proximity to Silicon Valley, I think. We have, there's a huge number of extremely bright, talented uh, computer scientists, software engineers, data scientists, and, and we draw on these people for, for, um, for our, you know, putting together our teams. Um, the, the challenge, I think, is that um, a lot of, you know, we're, we're dealing with quote unquote big data, and that, that idea has gotten some kind of a mystique, right? And um, there are an awful lot of people who think they know how to handle big data, and, and they may. But the data we're dealing with is, is very, very different from, you know, the other kinds of big data that the Silicon Valley is dealing with. Um, and we've had a number of cases where we've had uh, um, consultants come in who are crack data scientists um, and there's almost this image I get of, you know, if we pour all the data in a bucket and shake it hard enough, science will come out. And, you know, we know that that's not how it works. There's, this is, the data is, is very highly structured, and more importantly, the, the way we handle it, the way we store it, has to be motivated by the scientific question that we have. And um, the, the frustration that we're facing is finding people who have this, this um, very, very strong quantitative background who, who uh, have also have a deep understanding of the science. And um, I think we're very lucky at Genentech that we've um, typically gotten people who are um, maybe biologists first who have then learned the, the computation, or computation, uh, computational scientists who have always had an interest in the biology and always kept up with it. But, um, you know, it's, it's not, you can't just plug and play uh, computational um, scientists the way you can maybe with some of the, resource, the, the uh, hardware resources. Um, there's a, um, yeah, and, and our, other, our other big challenge with, with talent is that there are now a, lot of, uh, now a lot of companies doing this kind of work, and so uh, there's a lot of demand, so. 
Ram, do you want to also sure. talk about it? Where do you find your team members and what are the challenges you see? Yeah, so uh, from my experience, we are more and more looking for people who are a good bioinformatician who also knows the, the sample quality, the DNA quality, the, the, the process that may cause these DNA problems, knows the, the, uh, the database, knows, can look at a BAM file saying this index is correct or not, but also knows the scientific question and knows how to uh, create a report that help uh, uh, oncologists and physicians to say which drugs works better or not. So it's really becoming uh, more and more requirement only by informaticians that you need to start from the beginning, model biologies, to the raw, low level qualities, also to the high level clinical questions. And uh, to answer your question, to finding the peoples, uh, we continue having this problem uh, getting more uh, qualified peoples. Just from a lab point of view, I found that LinkedIn actually works pretty yeah. well. <laughs> good, good advice. Thank, thank you, Ron. Sure. So the, the last set of challenges are around uh, technology um, and IT infrastructure. Uh, you know, we hear about cloud computing and, uh, you know, the very specialized data centers large organizations are putting together to uh, solve some of these challenges. And uh, it seems that, you know, still not good, good enough in, in many cases and people are looking for hybrid solutions that can run on premises for certain clinical applications or for cost effectiveness and then use the cloud for elasticity and sometimes for centralization of the data and collaboration between different institutions. Uh, we see that genomics information is not helpful if it is isolated from other information. So how can you connect that genomic information to phenotypic information or other uh, molecular information or imaging data is very important and these systems usually are built by you know, different interfaces or, or, or teams. Uh, and then we see that you know, production grade really end-to-end -end solutions um, uh, are needed if you want to scale genomic research at institutes. Uh, so Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about how you are solving these problems at Genentech and where you see that there are uh, biggest opportunities for progress? One of the things that I learned very early on was not to optimize prematurely. It's like you have a problem, you need to solve the problem, don't worry about how much time it's taking at first, don't worry about how much um, memory it's taking, don't worry about the resources. The first thing is to get the algorithm right. And I think a lot of us have, have, have taken that maybe a little, we've taken it appropriately to heart. But um, if you look at um, the tools we're using now, um, and this is true both for tools that, that, you know, that we've developed internally and tools that we use that are commercial, um, that the, the, the premature optimization was avoided, but then the optimization actually has never really happened yet, right? So um, we rely on what are you know, thought of as industry standard tools, but they're still kind of in this phase where they have not been made you know, battle hardened for, um, you know, for indus industrial scale, right? And so um, I think one of, the, one of the insights that we've had in my group is you know, we may be good at coming up with some with, you know, with so, uh, algorithms to solve problems, we're not software engineers, and we need to stop pretending we are, and we need to really outsource the expertise you know, to companies that actually really know how to do this well. And um, I think that's sort of the, the trend that's happening in the industry that's most encouraging to me is that we can kind of step back a little bit and you know, we can prototype something and, and send it to a, um, a collaborator who's actually really good at developing the software mm -hmm. and trust that now we can scale up and, um, and, you know, and, and uh, get some real mileage out of that. That's great. Thank you, Rong. Uh, we were just talking about how you think that industry needs actually to develop new database architectures and schema to help you with these complex annotation problems that you have. Do you want to talk a little bit about sure, it? Sure, yeah. So there are, <coughs> there are a lot of talks about uh, new algorithms to kind of uh, uh, build index on the VCF files to allow you to query. But from my experience, the query we're really looking to solve questions are too complex to be handled by these simple index algorithms. The database is still probably the best solution to allow you to join hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, genomes with electromagnetic record to look at longitudinal how you change and so on. However, that uh, so as many people know me, I already have s at least 400 database, uh, 150,000 genomes can in the database, but we are really hitting the bottleneck on the systems. We need a better 
a database system that can really handle like millions of genomes, allow you not just looking for a single variance cross cohorts, we're really looking at the patterns that, uh, uh, how these patterns being seen across hundreds of different disease cohorts and so on. And really looking at a single mutation, not really break like this pattern, but creating new patterns. And this really needs more comprehensive, uh, probably next generation hardware systems to really allow us to do more comprehensive query against this uh, genome phenome uh, database. And uh, especially if also you have an interface on top of this database, allow you to uh, visualize all this trend of the data to answer questions, uh, I think that can really help us uh, along the way. That's great. Thank you, Ron. So, you know, to, to wrap it up, we, we heard that there are really different challenges in four categories, uh, scientific challenges, technological challenges, people, and processes. Uh, at Bina, we want to build a product that solves all these problems. That, sounds, uh, that might sound very ambitious, uh, but what we figured out is that we cannot focus on only one of these challenges because in order to really partner with the scientists, bioinformaticians and clinicians, you need to have a you know, one-stop solution that includes all of them. But at the same time, we realize that it takes a long time to develop this and you need many different input and insight from the scientific domain, from the computational domain. So the way that we work with our customers usually is, is very, very collaborative and we define the you know, right set of features or capabilities that need to exist in this product to solve both analytics problem, data management, as well as the kind of uh, people framework to bring uh, different expertise together. So um, I want to open up the floor for questions to our panelists. Uh, also, I want to remind everyone that we have a poll going on. You can have your voice heard around you know, what, what are the bioinformatics challenges if you go to bina.com slash poll. Uh, so I have some questions for our panelists, but first I wanted to open up to the audience to see if there is any questions. There's a microphone in the, in the front if there's any questions. Okay, seems everyone is very content. So I will ask, okay, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, I was just curious uh, about how companies like Genentech are thinking about handling, okay, so there's genetic variation, right, but there's also epigenetic variation and genome organization and all of these different things that are layers and layers, different tissues have all of these different properties. We're having challenges just with the genetic part, let alone layering all of that stuff on top of it, so I'm just curious how big companies are thinking about handling that. I think it really comes down to the, the scientific question that you have. So for our uh, non-oncology programs, um, the genetics is sort of the, 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 the primary question that we are, we're asking. Um, we're not taking tissue-specific samples in any way. Um, on the oncology side, on the other hand, you, know, we ha you need tumor samples, you need, and, you know, and preferably match normal, and, um, and, then, and there's something to be gained from RNA-seq, for example, from tumor normal. Um, you know, I think the, the, the tendency is to want to get comprehensive data sets for everything, and the reality is there's just not enough resources for that. So, you know, if there's a good indication that there's an epigenetic component to some disease, then we'll focus on, on getting those, you know, those samples um, and, and getting that data. But um, we, we really do want to avoid just sort of, you know, covering the whole universe of possibilities because it's just, you know, we have enough to deal with this, you know, with, with very well thought out primary questions as it is. Thank you, Matt. So I have a question for uh, our panelists. Uh, I know there are you know, several vendors also at, at, in this room, and uh, they're all working towards solving the informatics challenge of, challenges of next generation sequencing. And sometimes you know, for, for startups and companies, it's hard to know where they can add value, where they can be most impactful, what are the gaps that they can go and make a difference. So if you wanted to give uh, advice to the informatics companies, uh, where do you think they should focus to be most useful to your research? Uh, so, so for me, I think the biggest value is still in the biobank. My dream has always been one million genomes with one million electro, uh, people's electromedical record with a longitudinal-free clinical measurement, uh, the clinical notes, all these. So I guess from a company point of view, if you have a, a product 
the using uh, either insurance pay or self pay to support you to really scale up to get to this one million uh, genomes uh, biobank. That would be the biggest value. Thank you, um, I guess the you know it's not quite as a grand vision, but um, you know we need help in. Um, in, in bringing our ideas into sort of a production system, right? So I think, you know, there, there are a lot of vendors I talk to who have great ideas, but who have not um, really listened to our scientific needs. And, you know, we have a very specific algorithm we want to implement. Um, we'd, we'd like to have that algorithm optimized. We don't want their algorithm, even though it might be very good, optimized, right? So I think um, getting, getting in close with the, with the scientists you're supporting and, and, and you know, listening to what the scientific use cases are and the scientific needs are and, and understanding that the, you know, the bioinformatics scientists are not software engineers, but they're still highly computational and they're not going to want to necessarily give up all of the, you know, the, the power about you know, with, with the data. Excellent. Thanks mm -hmm. so much. We have some questions, Matt. Uh, last month, the NIH had an RFI out asking the question of where do you see a need for exascale computing coming in biomedicine? Um, I've talked to a number of people who believe that there is an order of magnitude or more to be gained merely by algorithm optimization. But I'd like to pose the question to you, where do you see the need for computing on a scale hundredfold bigger than than we do now. Yeah, so yes, we actually we are replying submitted to this RFI at Mount Sinai. <laughs> <laughs> so currently, like I said, we have these one hundred thousand genomes, but in our database, we can only looking at a single variants. We are not able to look at the patterns, combination of variants across all these hundreds of disease cohorts. So if there is a, I I believe the database is still the best. Uh, infrastructure to kind of handle these complex, uh, open-ended questions, but the current database infrastructure are not able to hosting these uh, uh, million, uh, at least 200,000 uh, whole genome coming out in the next four years, right? So how we have uh, a database systems that can hosting all these complex uh, phenotypic uh, information and allow you to query not just for single variant but for uh, combination and patterns and also has an uh, easy interface allow you to run statistics and to visualize explore all this uh, phenome genome relationship I think that will be great mm -hmm. okay. okay go ahead Next thank question. you um, so one thing I haven't heard any talk about yet is compression of the data. Mm. Um, I'm from the VC world actually, but one of our portfolio companies is working on this problem. Um, our, uh, FastQ, BAM, um, already achieving double digit compression ratios. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering what do you think are the biggest opportunities and challenges with um, compression specifically? So, if I could take that. So, so when we started on our, um, our, our program to, to get whole genome sequencing data from our clinical trial subjects, the initial idea was is we couldn't afford to keep the BAMs. We were going to keep just the VCFs. And um, that would have addressed our primary uh, questions very nicely to have the, to have the GVCFs for the, for the patients. Um, but obviously, there's a huge amount of data on you know, genome rearrangements and um, structural variation in the BAMs. Um, right now, we are sort of winging it in terms of keeping the BAMs. We're hoping that we can uh, grow our, our storage fast enough that it's not going to be a big problem. But uh, I'd probably like to talk to you after this, actually. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this panel. Thanks, your panel. Mm -hmm.